open your Bibles to the book, the prophet Jeremiah. It's in the Old Testament, chapter 33. Chapter 33. It's going to take some of y'all a long time to find it. Just go to the table of contents. Chapter 33 of Jeremiah, and I want to read verses 1 through 3. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 33, beginning at verse 1. Beginning at verse number 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord who made it, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord is his name. Verse, th verse 3. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Amen. That's a powerful verse right there, verse 33. God says, call to me, I will answer and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. We serve a God who desires to show you how awesome he is. All right, and I want to talk about, can you hear me now? Say that, can you hear me now? You can be seated. How many of y'all got cell phones? How many of you know that there are certain places that you can go that the cell phone don't work? I know when I'm on the phone, I know there are certain places when I go and I'm talking on my cell phone that the cell phone doesn't work. So I know when I get to those places, I either need to not be on the phone or I know if I'm in the basement of my house today, it doesn't work. It's not going to ring. I can't talk to anybody. So I, if I want it to work, I got to come out of the basement. I know that it, uh, if I'm riding in the car, look at your neighbor saying, not driving, just riding. <laughs> if I go into certain areas, I know when I get there, it's, it's not going to work. So I know not to make a call when I get in that area. I know not to make a call. Uh, I learned that because when I had traveled through those places before, it wasn't working. Somebody be talking, all of a sudden they don't, they stop talking, or I'm talking that they can't hear me, and I find myself saying, can you hear me now? The reality is in a lot of our lives, we find ourselves talking to God and trying to get an answer from God, and trying to get God to resolve issues in our lives, and God doesn't answer. And we're wondering whether or not God can hear us now. And I know that's true because of the number of y'all that come up and ask me to pray for y'all because y'all don't think y'all prayers can get through. So I'm tired of y'all asking me to pray for y'all. So wh what I want to do today is spend some time teaching you why it is God is not answering your prayers. As a matter of fact, there are several, several reasons. I got seven I want to try to hit and go through today. Seven reasons, seven reasons why God won't answer your prayer. Now, I don't know about y'all. I want God to answer my prayers. Hold up, let me back up. I need God to answer my prayers. And God wants to answer your prayers. It's not that God is duck, ducking and dodging you. It's not that he doesn't want to answer your prayer. God wants to answer your prayers. But the Bible is clear with instructions on reasons why God won't answer your prayer. I'm going to walk through these seven. I want you to examine your life and see that if any of these might be the reasons why God's not answering your prayers. So y'all can stop coming up asking me to pray for y'all. Look at your neighbor and say, he talked about you. Amen. Here's what Jeremiah 33 and 3 says. God says, call to me. You say, call to the pastor. He said, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. God says he wants to show you such incredible things that it'll blow your mind that you never imagined. I wonder if anybody here ever had God do something for you in life that it absolutely blew your mind that that, that happened. The word call means cry out to God. It means to open your mouth, make a proclamation, make a sound. Some of y'all like to pray silent prayers. God says, open your mouth. 
call to me, pray, make a sound, utter something, reach out to me, and he says, I will answer. And the word answer in the Hebrew is an interesting word because it means he'll speak back. He'll speak back. Matter of fact, in the Hebrew, it means he'll shout back. In other words, he's going to answer you in such a loud way that you know that nobody but God I don't know if y'all ever had a situation where you prayed about something that you didn't discuss with anybody and then God answered your prayer and you know that only God could have been the one to answer that prayer. He says, so, so you call, you cry out to me, make a shout out to me and I'll shout back at you. And he says, I will show you. Somebody say show. show. That word show means he's going to announce it, make a publication about it. He's going to make everybody see. He's going to put it on blast that everybody can see what he's done for you in your life. So the question is, why isn't God answering your prayers? Why isn't he putting you on blast? How come your prayers aren't being answered? There's several, several reasons. Let me walk down through seven. Here's number one. Let's start by going to Isaiah chapter 59. Now the book of Isaiah is, is the book before Jeremiah. Go backwards. I say it for the benefit of the person sitting next to you because I know you know where it is. Isaiah chapter 59, and I want to read verses 1 and 2. Say, I got it when you get it. Okay, the rest of y'all too slow. Write it down. This is a Bible study. Verse 1, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Wow. I didn't expect to get too many amens from the 10 o'clock crowd. And there'll be even fewer amens at the 12 o'clock crowd. <laughs> the scripture says God's hand is not short, his ear is not heavy. He's still able to save and he's still able to hear. But here's what has separated us. Verse 2, your iniquities and your sins. What's the difference? Iniquities and your sins. Your, 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 your sins mean to miss the mark. You just missed the mark. You did what you shouldn't have done. Your sins. Your iniquities are wickedness. It means not only did you, not only did you sin, but you planned to sin. Premeditated sin. You orchestrated it. You, you wanted it. So you orchestrated to make it happen. That's wicked. It's one thing for you to be walking and living your life and trip up and fall and mess up and get up and brush yourself off and go on. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up, brushes himself, lives on. But iniquity is when you are walking through life and trip up and fall and stay there. Lay down in the mud. Move in. Pay rent. Move other folk in. Come on, talk to me for just a second. I'm talking to you. You make it convenient. You make it, you make it acceptable. You, 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 ex, you excuse it. You embrace it. You practice it. You buy it. You plan it. You subscribe to it. That's iniquity. That's iniquity. And God says when you buy the sin, when you accept it, when you move in, when you make it a course of life, it's wickedness. And he says it's difficult for me to answer your prayer. It's hard for me to answer your prayer when you're shacking, when you move up and live in together. It's hard. It's hard for me to answer when you buy a subscription to the Playboy channel on your cable thing, when you're paying more to the cable company than you are in your tithes and offerings to God. Ooh, I must be coming down y'all street now. It's hard for me to do it when you purposely plan to go to the store and liquor and do the liquor. Yeah, 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 yeah. God says I can't do it when you are in iniquity and sin. You've excused it, you've embraced it, you've accepted it as a lifestyle. It was I believe. I believe God. You know, uh, all of us done done some sin, Mr. Mark, and this whole section right here has planned some of their sin. God says that was, that's what makes it difficult for me to respond to you because you got stuff going on that makes it extremely difficult for me to hear and respond. That's number one. Here's number two. I got seven. I got to run through these real quick. Here's number two. Go to Psalm 66. So that first one is sinful behavior. Did y'all get that? Sinful behavior. Here's the second one, Psalm 66, verse 18. Did I tell y'all this was a Bible study? Since y'all don't come to Bible study, this is a Bible study, I bring it to you. You 
You know, when I go around and talk to pastors around the church, around the country, they say, how many people come to your church? So I tell them, I say, how many people come to your Bible study? I say, 4,000 people come to Bible study at a time. I don't tell them the Bible study is on Sunday morning, but I'm just telling them. <laughs> Here's verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Do y'all see that right there, verse 18? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not see. So, so when I talked about um, Isaiah 59, it was what you did. But when we talk about Psalm 66 and verse 8, it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, if I regard it. Somebody say, if I regard it. Here's what that means. I don't have to do it is a problem with my walk with God and him answering my prayer is I don't have to do it. Psalm 66 and verse 18 says, if I regard it. That word regard in the Hebrew means if I can see it, if I can imagine it, if I can picture it in my mind. Matter of fact, what he says, if I regard it in my heart. And the word heart means your thoughts and your feelings. It means if I can see a picture in my mind and if I can feel it in my, in my heart, if I, if I can remind myself what it felt like, what it feels like. Now that's an important thing because some of y'all have gone around think, thinking and feeling that as long as I don't do it, I'm okay. If I can dream about it and ponder it and picture it from every side and imagine it, I'm okay as long as I didn't do it. But Psalm 66 and verse 18 says it does matter. The scripture says if I picture it in my mind, if I got the picture and the image in my mind, and if I can feel it in my heart, it, it's, it's a, it makes it a Difficult for God to respond to my prayer. Matt, hold up, hold up. Matter of fact, the verse says, the Lord will not hear. It didn't say he might not hear. It says he will not hear. I am teaching and preaching better than y'all are saying amen. I, I know it's difficult to say amen when I hit you on the, on the, and talk about you, but that's the reality. Now, this is an important thing. Now, here's what we got to get out of this in our walk with God. If we want to live a life that God answers our prayers, and I'm going to tell you something. There's nothing like living a life to when you pray and God answers your prayer. Nothing can compare. You know what's even greater? What's even greater is that you live the kind of life that when, you, when you're living your life that you don't even have to utter the prayer, God answers the prayer before you even ask him about it. What I've discovered in my walk with God is this. This is what is important. God wants to answer your prayer. He wants to show you great and mighty things according to the scripture. The eyes of the Lord is looking to and fro for somebody through whom he might show himself strong. So what that tells me is when we learn about what it is that causes him not to hear, it's telling me that what God wants us to do is take control of our thought life. You got to take control of your thought life. You got to take, a, take control of what you think. Somebody say what you think. You got to take control of what you think. That's what's important to God. Not just what you do, but also what you think. Take it a step further. Take it a step even deeper and say, let me manage, let me control what's going on in my head. Let me not think that I can just think about anything. See, see, see it's, 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 a thought will come to your mind, but you don't have to let the thought land. You don't have to let the, let the bird fly by. You don't have to let the bird stop, lamb, lay eggs, build a nest, have baby eggs, let those eggs uh, develop and break out. And now you don't got 10, 10 more, more complicated, more in-depth thoughts. Oh, I can tell what I'm talking to y'all. Y'all get quiet. Control it. Nip it in the bud. When you see it flying by, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us you have to arrest your thought life. You have to take every thought captive. When you get a chance, read 2 Corinthians 10. He says, take every thought captive. And any thought that doesn't agree with God, what God's word and will is for your life, capture that thought and seize it. Because here's what happens. I need you to understand this. When you sow a thought, when you accept a thought, you reap a feeling. When you sow a feeling, you reap an act. When you sow an act, you reap a habit. When you reap a habit, when you sow a habit, you reap a lifestyle. When you sow a lifestyle, you reap a destiny. Let's be clear, if you keep on living your life a certain kind of way, you will not be called a child of the Most High God. Come on, talk to me, say amen somebody. If it's your life, if it's your lifestyle, if this is the way you live your life, 
The Bible says certain people will not make it into heaven if it's your life. Somebody say, well, Pastor, I got this problem, I got that issue. Here's what I believe. I believe that if you have a walk with God, if you have a relationship with Jesus, when you make a mistake, when you sin, when you do something you ain't got no business doing, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, pokes you in the side and say, hey, you, yo. Matter of fact, you, before you even do it, the Holy Ghost say, hey, You, get, you got two voices talking to you all the time. You got the voice of God and you got the voice of the devil. You got the spirit of God and you got the voice of the devil. The devil say, you who? Hey. And God says, hey, leave that alone. I walk in the store. The Twinkies say, yay, hey. I'm over here. I said, who is that talking to me? And I walk over by the Twinkies and say to them, oh, they brought the Twinkies back. They had gone out of business. <laughs> and while I'm over there looking at the Twinkies and contemplating one last Twinkie, uh -huh. put your situation in this situation right here. You contemplated one last time, one last connection. Come on, look at y'all, talk to me. One last opportunity. One last roll in the hay, one last hit, one last hot time, one last getting drunk, one last going to the club. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm practicing for the 12 o'clock crowd. <laughs> While I'm sitting there looking at the Twinkies, something say, hey, Jenkins, you know you ain't got no business with those Twinkies. Walk on away, leave them alone. You know you got diabetes, you know you got high blood pressure. You know you ain't got no business, and I have a choice. And I have the choice to reach down and grab the Twinkies or to turn around and walk away. You got a voice talking to you. Now, if you ain't got no relationship with God, I know that's not good English, but that's good preaching. If you have no relationship with him, you won't hear that voice. You won't hear God say, walk away. Matter of fact, you know when you did what you had no business doing, the Holy Ghost said, now you know you didn't have no business doing that. If you can keep on sinning, and if you can keep on committing iniquity, if you can keep on living in a life and there's no voice talking to you, you better reevaluate whether you are a child of God in the first place. I wish I had time to hang there, but I don't. But just get the point that number one is sinful behavior, number two is sinful thoughts. When you got the thoughts in your mind and you harbor those thoughts and think about it, it causes God to not be able to hear your prayer. Here's number three. I wish I had time to hang there. I don't. Let's go, back. Let's go to James chapter 4. James 4. That's in the New Testament, page 1065. <laughs> James 4, verses 3. Verse 3. Listen to this verse right here. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. God says, you ask and I don't give it to you because you ask amiss. That word amiss means because you're asking for a worthless reason. You're asking for something that's not good, not beneficial to you, therefore God says, I can't answer it. You ask, you ask and it is, it, is, it is according that you might spend it, verse number three, on your own pleasures. It's all about you. It's not about the kingdom. It's not about advancing God's kingdom. It's about you. And, and that's an important point to make because God's saying, you're asking me for a car. You want a car, but you ain't using the hoopty that you got now for the right reasons. God is saying, why should I give you a car and you're just going to use the car to keep going to the club? Come on, talk back to me for a second. Y'all making this so hard. Just you're making, you're making this a difficult message to give. I'm trying to give you the truth to make you have understanding and clarity. That God says, I want to I wanna bless you, but you're not using what you have for the kingdom of God. You, you, you don't come to church. You ain't in Bible study. not involved in the ministry. But you're asking me for a car. You ain't using the hoop. You ain't picking up nobody, bringing them to church. But you're asking for a car for your own selfish reasons. You don't need me to give you a new house. You ain't making room for nobody, no homeless person, no person with need. You, you just, you just want to, so you can brag to your friends about your new house in Mitchellville. Come on, talk to me for a second. 
When we make it our, our agenda to, to promote God's agenda and to promote God's program, then the God we serve will see that our, he will advance our cause when our cause advances his. Number four. So, so that number three is the wrong reasons, the wrong motives. Here's number four. It's 1 John 5. Not the Gospel of John, but 1 John. Chapter 5, and I'll read verses 14 and 15. Listen to this. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Stick a pin right there. Somebody say, stick a pin right there. We got confidence that if we ask him, Anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. In other words, God is saying, I'll ask, I'll answer you if what you ask is according to his will. Which means that the reason he may not be answering you is because what you're asking him is not according to his will. Now let me help you out for a second. No need of you asking God to give you the number that's going to be played on the lottery. That is not according to his will. Oh, I must have hit something right there. That's not his will. There's no need of you asking him to let somebody else hurry up and get divorced so you can hurry up and marry them. Y'all making this such a tough message right here. I'm trying to help you out. Somebody say, well, Pastor, how do I know his will? You find his will in his word. His will, his word is manifested. His will is manifested in his word. Punch the person next to you and wake them up. I wish people would go to bed on Saturday nights. Please wake, please wake them up before, before I come and wake them up. I feel a slap them upside the head anointing. I know it's hard. I'm not, I'm not trying to put you to sleep. You're going to need this. Maybe you don't think you need it now, but at some point in your life, you're going to need what I'm telling you today. You're going to need it. You pray according to the will of God. And if it's in line with his will, the scripture says we can know that he hears us. Let's be assured of this. God is not playing hide and seek. He ain't trying to hide from you. He's not trying to duck and dodge. He wants to manifest himself to you. And the best thing we can do is examine ourselves and find out why it is he's not responsive to our prayers. That was number four. It's outside of his will. Somebody say outside of his will. Here's number five. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 7. And I have to be honest. Can I be honest with y'all? Here's one of those verses I wish had never made it into the Bible. I didn't write the Bible. If I did, this verse wouldn't be in here. I don't know why God would go and mess up a nice Bible by putting a verse like this in it. And it's verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding. That's disgusting, ain't it? Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and has been heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Why would God go and mess up a beautiful book like the Bible by putting this verse in there? But to be honest, this verse transformed my life. It changed me. Because God told me, one, two, three, four, five, six, these last seven words, that your prayers may not be hindered. I love living a life where God answers my prayer. I love that kind of life. There's no way to describe the kind of life when you talk to God and he's answering your prayers no matter how small, how minor, how many. And then he took me to this verse and basically said, if I want him to keep on answering my prayers, I had to, here's, here's the word that God used for me. I had to learn to be more sensitive. Amen. 
That's, that's, that's my word to describe what men have to be. We have to be sensitive for our wives. And I, and, and I had to learn to be sensitive. I had to learn to engage in my wife's world. I had to learn to feel what she feeling and be compassionate. I had to learn to listen to her talk. Because I was insensitive. I'd go in and change the channel. She'd be watching TV. I'd go in and change the channel. The game is on, you Don't you know the game is on, girl? The game is on. <laughs> but I had to be sensitive. God had to teach me. And I discovered, y'all might not like this, brothers. Don't, don't leave me. I'm going to say something here that's going to cause women to cuss at me. But y'all stand with me. Women can be difficult to understand. One brave man. <laughs> and the older they get, the more difficult it can be to understand them. It's difficult. Change and moves, don't know what they want. Hot, cold, open the window, close the window, turn the heat on, turn the heat off. Turn the air on, turn the air off. Don't, this is difficult, amazing. It's just, oh, Jesus, man. It's complicated. A second brave man comes to the table. scratching his head like you know what I'm saying? <laughs> thank you Lord I appreciate it so I had to learn to be sensitive because I wanted why I wanted God to answer my prayers I had to enter into her world I had to go into her world I had to go shopping with her I had to watch her programs on television I had to read the books that she's reading I had to hear her talk about all the stuff she wanted to talk about to take her two hours to tell me one little thing that she needed to tell me We could have saved an hour and 59 minutes by you just telling us the bottom line. Listen, I gotta hurry up, hold on, hold on. I had to become sensitive and so I've, I've, I've started going shopping with her. I started listening to her conversation. What? Wow. Really? Oh, I'm good, y'all. I'm good at it now. Man. Do say that. What, girl? Do say. I'm a bad dude, y'all. I'm telling you. I watch her programs. Home and Gardening Channel. Design on a Dime, House Hunters. Oh, wait, wait, wait. House Hunters International. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. The Property Brothers. Some from bad dudes right here. Property Brothers. I like them dudes. Them brothers smooth. I entered into her world. I go shopping with her. Yeah, she ain't gonna buy nothing, but I just go store to store. With her. <laughs> now, hold up. Man, I gotta hurry up. My time is up. But listen. God answers my prayer because I'm sensitive. I just, wherever way she wanna flow, I'm flowing with her. And I believe even though the verse talks to men, I believe it's also true about women. I believe it's true that you gotta have marital harmony and the women gotta be sensitive to the man. Now it ain't tough to figure out we easy to please. Come on, tell your neighbor. We easy to please. Don't take a whole lot. Don't take a whole lot. Come on, brothers. Don't leave me hanging out here by myself. 
Y'all some tired jokers. Y'all some tired jokers. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Huh? He's just shaking my hand. He said, I ain't got no money. I just want to shake your hand. I'm sorry. Woo, Jesus. It don't take, I was saying, listen, ladies, it don't take a whole lot to please a man. It don't take a whole lot. One thing. I think I told y'all this before. If I, if I told you this before, forgive me. My friend Steve Jameson passes out in Seattle, Washington. He was preaching. He's preaching one day, he says to the wives, the husbands just need one thing to make them happy. One thing. He told them what that one thing was. Y'all know what it is. That one thing. Church got over his deacon, one of his deacons and his wife were driving home. The wife said, is that true what the pastor said? That this one thing that a man needs and that's all he needs is one thing. Is it that important? He looked at his wife and said, baby, it's number one, number two. <laughs> Y'all not hearing me here. I gotta hurry up. Here's number that's number five, marital conflict. Number six is Matthew 17. Jot it down. The disciples are brought a sick child, and they're not able to heal that sick child. Verses 14 through 21. Read it when you get an opportunity. This man brought his sick child to the disciple who, who was having epileptic seizures. And the disciples could not heal him. And so they brought him to Jesus, and Jesus rebuked the, the demon in the child, healed the child. And then they asked Jesus in verse 19, why could we not cast this demon out? And Jesus said to them in verse 20, because of your unbelief. When you come to God, somebody say, when you come to God, you got to believe. That's number six. The reason he doesn't answer because you don't believe. You have doubts. You have questions. You got to believe. Uh, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, when you come to God, you must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have to believe. You have to come to God and believe he's going to answer your prayer. You got to believe he's a burden bearer, a heart regulator, a mind fixer. You got to believe he's a healer. You got to believe he can put money in your bank. You got to believe he can pay your bills. You got to believe that he can answer your prayers. Without faith, it's impossible to, believe, to, to please God. Here's my final seventh thing. I hate to rush through this. I'm sorry. It's in Proverbs 28 and 9. Here's what Proverbs 28 and 9 says. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, one who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. If in your life you've disregarded the word of God as a, a staple in your life, the guide in your life, to orchestrate your life, to call the shots in your life. If you're calling your own shots and you don't even regard what the word says, the Bible says your prayers are an abomination to God. If you don't use it to guide and orchestrate your decision, some of you are in a mess and God can't answer your prayer because you don't, you don't give any credence to the decisions that you make in life. You don't give any credence to the scriptures. And that's why your life is a mess. That's why your marriage is a mess. Your kids are jacked up. Your business is out, out, just out of control. Because you don't, you know, here's what the Bible calls this. The, the Bible is a prescription. It is a prescription. It is the prescription for your ills. And if you don't listen to it, it'll, God says, when you do try to pray, it'll be an abomination. Now, let me close. I'm sorry I had to rush through this. I had many, much more to say, but you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. I don't know about y'all, but I can look through these seven points and see I've been guilty of all seven. Yeah. 
At some juncture in my life, I've done them all. But I got great news. God knows our sin and the blood of Jesus is able to wipe the slate clean. You might be guilty. But he's made provision to forgive you and give you a fresh start, let you start over. And I believe there's somebody here today who say, you know what, I've been guilty of some of these things and I want to start over, I want a fresh start. The best thing you can do is say, you know what, I want Jesus to be my Lord. Get up out of your seat and come down here right now and say, I want him to be my Lord. I want him to be my master. Don't be ashamed, don't be afraid. Just get up and make your way down here. Nobody will look down their nose or talk about you. We will shout and give God the glory the moment, the moment you step out and make your way here. Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood so you and I can have life, have it more abundant. Come right now, I see you, amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you, man. Step right there. Don't go anywhere. How you doing, man? Wait right there.